It's only chapter 6 in Mark, but as a lot has already happened. Mark does not tell the story of the Immaculate Conception, of the meeting of Elizabeth and Mary, or of the birth of the baby Jesus. And it makes sense because you only discuss in great detail those things that are very important to you. And we're going to take a quick um, informal survey, and your participation is key. All you have to do is raise your hand. Who could speak in great detail about clothing? You got, a, you got a way up high. There you go. All right. Who could speak in great detail about um, proper manners? Yeah. Sports? Heisman Trophy winner since 1992? I can do that. Um, food? Yeah, there we go. <laughs> um, it, if, you, if I came home from a wedding and Katie said, so what happened? What do you think, I, what would you guess I would say? Well, you know, bride and groom and did what we did and, and had cake and then we came home. Okay, I go to um, the Tennessee-Alabama game that goes into double overtime. She says, well, what happened? Well, first of all, we got out of the car. <laughs> then we were walking towards the stadium and then this happened. Um, you you have to realize how human the gospel writers are to realize they do the exact same thing. They emphasize um, different things. And so in the first chapter of Mark, um, Jesus is already being tempted. Um, so we have, I have pictures that go along with each of the chapters. First chapter of Mark, Jesus is already being tempted, is calling the, his disciples, healing, and being baptized. In the very first chapter, that doesn't happen um, as much in the other ones. In chapter 2, he's healing and capturing the attention of both crowds and his enemies for the first time. In chapter 3, he's sending his disciples out and having such a meteoric rise that his family is questioning him as to whether he is who he says he is. You know, a person um, rises at such a level and even their family think, wow, is this really what you wanted to do? Is this really who you are? In chapter 4, he talks about growth through the parables. And in chapter 5, he's again healing. It's important to lay this out for you because I want to establish the pace at which this story travels in Mark. And it helps explain our story today. The apostles are gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. That's, that's in our scripture lesson. They've already been called and already been asked to do a number of different things. He said, I want you to go out and I want you to find people that will follow me. Now, if you're packing for a trip, five days, how many suitcases? You know, it all depends. Yeah, you're, it all depends on the size. Your monster, rectangle, and then your carry-on or, you know, whatever. He says, I don't want you to take anything with you. I just want you to go. And if you're good enough and if you get in people's homes, they'll feed you. So don't worry about food. Don't worry about money. I want, I want you just to go. Now, you have men that were fishermen before. Now going out and being salesmen, essentially, knocking on doors to tell people about Jesus. Now, would that, be, would that go absolutely the way that they wanted it to go? Likely not. There'd likely be some hiccups. There'd likely be some funny stories. So they've all been working very hard, and they're returning back together just at the start of our story um, from telling people about Jesus. You, you figure there's, there's at least two things. You've got elation from a job well done because they've gathered people in, and you've also got exhaustion from travel and work. How many of you have, been, have left on Monday and come back on Thursday on a regular basis? My dad used to do that. Um, what's it like on Friday morning? You know, you just, you're just kind of groggy. Um, my dad would say, I'd wake up in a hotel every once in a while and have to open the door to see where I was. Um, because you're traveling so much, you just kind of lose um, your bearings um, as to where you were. So they come back and they are simply exhausted. Now you figure, um, you get a couple people like that, coming back and gather them in a group, they're going to start telling stories of what happened, of the successful ventures, of being chased with some sort of broom ventures, of the absolute failures um, of, of venturing out. Now, here's the problem. 
they return to bad news. Horrible news, in fact. John the Baptist led the way before Jesus started. He was doing what they were doing before they were disciples. He was going out and telling people, someone is coming, greater than I, that is going to change your life forever and become your Savior. He sets the whole thing up. Um, and he has one major problem. King Herod is in a relationship with his new wife, who was the wife of his brother. And John the Baptist says to them, you know, this isn't really the best idea. And he says it in a much harsher fashion than that. And so Herod's new wife says, this guy's got to go. You, you can't talk like that about me, and you can't talk like that about the king. Plus, I don't want you stirring up trouble, so he's got to go. So she comes with this big elaborate story of the way in which she coerces King Herod into killing John the Baptist. And so the original one that was going out and selling everyone on Jesus, when they come back, they find that he's been killed by the king. Now that could be devastating news, couldn't it? Of, um, uh, in terms of morale, in terms of your dear friend who's now not coming back. And it could also be a word of warning that, all right, are we supposed to go back out again? Because this is what happened the last time someone went out and someone spoke out against authorities. And so they've got this hard news to deal with. And then you get verse 31. Then because so many people were coming and going, they didn't have a chance to eat, Jesus said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves to a boat in a solitary place. Now how long will you anticipate going somewhere to a solitary place if you know it's coming? months, a couple weeks, you know for a fact that you're leaving and that it's going to be fun and that you are going to get away from everything. Um, I, I can't, I've talked to Rich, I've talked to our people that have moved here from Chicago probably for a month now about going to Chicago and you get the excitement of going somewhere, of seeing something different and of relaxing. There's only, there's only one problem. As they get in their boat and they go to the solitary place, you have verse 33. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. So, if you've ever been scared of the phone ringing while you're on vacation, consider all the people that might call you on the phone instead just arriving at your place of vacation before you do and being ready when you get there. That could be a devastating thing um, to people that have given everything they have to their work and now want to go to this solitary place. And if you notice, Jesus does this frequently. Gets away to a solitary place because what he's doing is so difficult and so against the grain. Now what's bringing those people there? Well, what brings people anywhere? Large mass groups of people. Wonder, excitement, opportunity, desperation. If you can grab one of these, you'll have a fair number of people. More than that, you'll get a pretty decent crowd. Any more than that, you are going to have a monster crowd, and they don't want you leaving. They want you around. And so those people are feeling that sort of thing, and they... They get there before the disciples do. Now, that call on vacation, that call during a nap, that call during dinner can be jarring. But like I said, work coming absolutely to you and being in your face can be even more. You see a very natural human reaction in 35. Verse 35. By this time it was late in the day, so the disciples said to him, 